Thank you, Marissa. The music team, grateful to God for you. And, uh, again, John, welcome home. Glad you're here. Acts 14. Take your Bible, turn there with the pastor, and we begin in verse 21. These uh, uh, days in February, I've started preaching about the church in Antioch. It's our home base, not Jerusalem. But Antioch, every mission that ever went out from any church anywhere all started in Antioch. It is our headquarters, our home base. We're going to look at that uh, this morning. There are two Antiochs, but only one. Uh, That is that home base. And we find that Paul and Barnabas have been sent out from Antioch. They've gone on the first missionary trip, and now they're coming home, and they're giving their testimonies about their missionary trip. Let me tell you, giving a testimony is good for church community and building and hearing what God is doing among the people. So I got a question for you this morning. You have a testimony? You have one? Your testimony is God saved me here. God grew me here. And this is what God is doing now, right now, right here in my life. It's not just a looking back. It's not just a rekindling. It's what God has done in the last 24 hours. So I pray you have a testimony. If you don't have a testimony, I'm going to invite you when I give the invitation, you walk right here to the front and say, Pastor, today's my day, the day before Valentine's Day. What a great day to fall in love with Jesus. Amen. Come and say, I want a testimony. I'm coming to give my life to the church and and membership and joining and have a testimony at my Antioch right here. Well, let the redeemed of the Lord do what? Say so. We ought to have a testimony within us. And we find this testimony right here in Acts chapter 14, beginning in verse 21. And I read through verse 28. You follow along as I read because this now is the word of our great God. And after they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, let me just parenthetically say, April 6 through 15, we're going to have 10 days of prayer and fasting here. I encourage you to join me. Pray wherever you want to at noon or come to the Corners building. I'm going to be there every day and staff and other folks will be there leading. You come pray with us for an hour, okay? No ice cream, no sandwiches, nothing. No free cookies like you got if you were leading the morning serving. We're praying and fasting. After they had prayed and fa- with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. They passed through Pisidia, came to Pamphylia. When they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Atella. From there they sailed to Antioch. That's the home base from where they had come. From there they sailed to Antioch from which they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had accomplished. And when they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all things that God had done with them and how he opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a long time with the disciples. They were sent out from Antioch. That Antioch is home base. You would find it just north of Syria today and in present day Turkey. I got a map up here just to show you where the one is, where the number one is. That's, that's Antioch. That's home base. Okay. South of there, you go down toward Israel, Jerusalem, the Dead Sea, and all that is down there. Uh, But north, just north of Syria, you find Antioch. They left there, went out into the Mediterranean, to Salamis, to Cyprus, the island, and then up they go to Perga, and you find them going up to number two, Antioch of Pasid. It's a different place than number one Antioch. This is a second Antioch. But don't miss just to the right and south 
is a little town called Lystra, L-Y-S-T-R-A. It's going to be a very important part of the message today of what happened in Lystra. So they came on that missionary trip, some by boat, then by land, and then they turned and came back and wound up back at Antioch giving a testimony. And when they stood up in Antioch, what did they talk about? Well, let me tell you a few things that they would have said. Uh, as Saul and Barnabas stood up, uh, first of all, they would have said, hey, thank you for sending us out. We got to Paphos and we encountered Elymas, E-L-Y-M-A-S. He's found in Acts 13, 10. And I can just hear uh, Paul standing up and saying, we, we met this dude, Elymas. He is a child of the devil filled with hell. And he came against us. And God gave us victory over a demon-possessed man. He said, what else happened on this missionary trip? They said, well, we left there. We went down to Pisidian Antioch. They said it was a glorious day. We preached the gospel and they begged us, preach more, preach more, preach more. Come back again and again and again and again, just like happens here every Sunday. Well, every now and again, I have people say to me, Pastor, you could have just gone on today. You quick too quick. Uh, others say, you, you preach past the Holy Ghost. Well, I understand that. But uh, here in, in this text, you, you find them in chapter 13, verse 42. Uh, they've just heard for the first time the gospel. They say, give us more, give us more, give us more. And Paul's given this great testimony w when he got there uh, to Antioch. And then he said, oh, yeah, yeah, what, one more thing. We stopped in Lystra. W we were in Lystra, and there was a lame man, and we prayed over him. God raised him up and healed him. And he said, man, the glory of God came. People were astonished. They had known this man all their life. And God gave him legs again. And then some of the people from the pagan temples came running out and tried to deify us. They said, these are gods. And Paul said, no, no, we're not gods. We're men just like you and nature's just like you. And that so upset some of the people of Lystra, the Bible says that they stoned Saul and drug him out of town and left him as dead. And shortly thereafter, he got up and went on his way. Some commentators believe that he really died and God raised him from the dead. Because of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians, that I knew a man who died and went to the third heaven and came back again. We don't know if Paul's speaking in a biographical way here about his own self. We don't know if he really died or not, but we know they stoned him and thought he was dead and left him for dead. And that's not even the good part of the testimony. He got up and went out. And then I want you to notice, here's the rest of his testimony. <laughs> Verse 21 that we just read. And after they had preached the gospel to the city and had made many disciples, they returned to, uh-oh. They went back to the stoning place. Lystra, the city of stones. They went back to, I'm, I'm like, Beat my eyes out once. I ain't going back. Not this preacher. But they went back to Lystra, and they went through those cities, strengthening the disciples. Can you imagine? Here's Saul and Barnabas, and they've already been stoned and either dead and resurrected or dead to the point of people thinking they're dead. And now they're going back through and encouraging the saints in that godless place. That was their testimony. They were saying, look what God did with us on this trip. Do you have a testimony? You have one? I've asked two people to come and share a testimony with us today, right in the middle of my preaching. Uh, first of all, Marissa Holmes is coming right now, and uh, her family is going to join her here, and uh, Marissa is going to share uh, she's a high school student here in our ministry. And right after she finishes, Joe Ehrenfeld is going to come. And they're sharing what God is doing in their life. 
They'll use this microphone right here. Marissa, thank you. Oh, here she is. You step right up here. Amen. And you share, sweet lady. So I was saved when I was five years old, probably like many of you, but I rededicated my life at the age of 14, and that is when I was baptized. So God has continued to impress upon my heart the desire to serve um, the, the need for it. Being completely honest, when I was younger, I did not have the desire to serve, um, I think just because of my own selfishness, but he impressed that desire on my heart, and the Holy Spirit has led me to serve, and now I am serving, and I have been blessed with the opportunity to serve here at Olive. I am a greeter every Sunday morning and for other special events as well, um, and that has really impacted my life. And I'm very thankful for it because through it I have formed deeper connections with my partner at the door as well as the people I get to greet each morning. Um, and I just feel that I am following in obedience to God to what he has called me to do. Thank you. God bless you. Joel, you come. Good morning, church. I brought my uh, beautiful bride Tara up with me. And... Uh, Pastor, I think it's important I got to start really with to rejoice in what God's doing, uh, reflect a little bit on what he has done. Um, and uh, Megan Cook, it's not an ironic thing that God had you mention that today in Sunday school we were teaching. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, active duty Air Force, and uh, that's an important part of the story, what God is doing in our lives, because uh, uh, we are from... Uh, we like to say real Florida, where they're actually having spring and green grass right now. But it, it's been a pleasure to be here in uh, Pensacola several times. And I'm reminded of Proverbs where uh, we're told that uh, man plans his way and God directs his step. Uh, there's no better way to do that in the military because those directions come in very clear orders every so many years. Um, but God has a sense of humor um, in the 17 years that we celebrate this month in that service. Uh, we've been, again, Air Force uh, assigned to Naval Air Station Pensacola three times. And because of that, we've had the pleasure of hearing you being members of this church three different times, and we've been a part of service over and over again. Uh, some good uh, servants you know, Mike Nimick and Fred Whitty, uh, asked us years ago to start the Adventurers, and we did that out of faithfulness, and it was a blessing to work with Gerald and Tammy Wood all those years and start that class. At about the time that Warrington came online, um, we met Sean Pillay. God had called us uh, away for a little while overseas, and uh, the group that we had in that uh, Adventures, uh, the Preston, the Hands, the Brooks, all began to serve faithfully as you started Warrington uh, in a faithful act of obedience there. And I think it's no irony, again, that Warrington has classes named the Explorers and now the Pathfinders that have grown out of that service. Um, and really our service is just simply God telling us to use the gifts that he gave us. Um, and as I discussed this with Tara, um, her heart had something to share. What, what service is to her? Um, so for me, it's obedience. God called us to serve his people and to grow his kingdom. And so we serve not just Joe, not just me, but as a family. Uh, service is something that your kids watch you do, and as they're watching you, they're learning, they're taking notes, and they will follow you. And so we serve as a family, um, straight out of obedience, and God has blessed us with a huge community because of that. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Blessed to be the name of the Lord. Amen. So, Joe, most families that over the time I've been here when they come the third time, they get out and just stay. He's given me this, and so we'll see. Amen. We're glad to have you back, back, back. Amen. We're glad that you're here. Marissa, thank you for sharing your soul with us today. You've heard testimony. You've heard testimony. Do you have one? What God's doing in, in your life? I pray you do. And if you do, you need that testimony to be anchored in an Antioch, in a church like this church, like this church in Antioch. What does that look like as we come together as a family and serve and have our testimonies all together? I want to show you four principles of Antioch. 
And that's where we need to be in our lives. First of all, about this church, this anchor church in Antioch, where they were giving their testimonies and where all of us give ours. First of all, the gospel is our primary focus. The first thing we do is the gospel. You've heard these testimonies talking about the gospel and how uh, they received Christ. You heard Marissa talk about early in her life, the gospel coming into her life, saving her soul. Do you have a time like that? Do you have a testimony where the gospel met you, where Jesus saved you? Can you take me to a place? Tell me of a time. Amen. I trust you do. The Antioch church had the gospel as its primary focus. Look at it in chapter 14 and verse number 7. We see it. And there they continued to preach the gospel. In verse number 15, and saying, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men. It's the same nature as you. Preach the gospel. And then down in verse number 21, and after they had preached the gospel. It is the gospel. It is the euangelion. It is the good news. That good news is that God sent His Son. His Son lived. His Son was crucified. His Son was buried. And God raised His Son Jesus from the dead. And He lives now forever, making intercession and offering salvation to whosoever would come and believe on him. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 17. You know these verses. For I am not ashamed, Paul said, of the gospel. He's the same one giving testimony in Antioch that wrote the book of Romans. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For it is the righteousness of God. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. That is is the gospel. That gospel is for Jew and Greek. That gospel is for rich and poor. That gospel is for pale and dark. That gospel is for east and west. That gospel is for whosoever will come to him can be saved. And church, we will never be, we will never be the Antioch that God wants us to be until this community knows that anybody who's willing to come follow Jesus and ready to follow our Jesus, that that is the path. And we would say to them, welcome, 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 welcome. No matter who they are, no matter their past, their background, but that we would say welcome. The gospel is the primary focus of Antioch. That's where we get our testimony. Secondly, church organization is important. We learned that from Antioch. You say, church organization? What in the world are you talking? Well, look at it in verse 23. The Bible said, and when they had appointed elders for, for them in every church, and having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they'd believed. They went to Lystra, started a church, elders. They went to Pisidia Antioch, elders, started a church. Uh, they went to Perga, elders, started a church. They went to Paphos, elders, started a church. And they put these, the word elder is the word presbyteros. We get our word Presbyterian from that word. It also has in its context maturation, age, maturity. They took the mature leaders and set them in place to lead the... Listen to me. No church will go farther than the mature leaders will take it. In our fellowship, we have pastors. And on our staff, we have these that serve in varied ways, and most of them... Uh, have an elder function. Then we have deacons that serve our church. We meet this Thursday night. We just ordained five new men uh, as deacons. It took us forever to ordain them, but we got it done. We, we ordained two, and then we ordained two more, and then we ordained one down at Warrington. I, these were the 
Hardest deacons to corral I ever had. I hope I'm not going to have trouble with them. I'm just telling you. They, uh, but we finally got them, and we prayed over them. They just had varied issues that we couldn't get them all together at the same time. Thank God for five new young men leading out in that way. Organization of the church with elders, presbyteros, with pastors, poimane, with the deacons, the akaneo. We, we take those, and these functions come, and we come together, and we become one taking the church where it needs to be. Now, listen to me. Listen. You listen and say yes. yes. If you are in a fellowship, you do not worship the pastor, you do not worship the elder, deacon, but you follow and you help. They're not perfect. How do I know that? Because I looked in the mirror this morning. They're not talking about perfection. We're talking about God's authority given certain times to certain people. And you are to follow with them. That's kept this church in unity all these years. Brother Russo, 17 years. Dr. Passmore, 17 years. Myself, 31. These last three pastors that we've gone together. Miss Russo, in just a few days, is going to turn 100 years old. The pastor's wife. They called her Miss Preacher what everybody called her when she was here. Uh, I locked my heels and saluted and said, yes, ma'am. That's what I did. I mean, I love that lady. And she encouraged me. And together we go forward. You see, a church that you're a part of, where you have your testimony, part of the testimony is that you are together with the other believers in it. Amen. Perfect? No. Have disagree? Sure, we disagree from time. But together, we're going forward, not for our good and our glory, but for His good and His glory. And we are undivided here so that His name can be reputable and unstained out there. The gospel, our primary focus. Church organization is important. Number three. Tribulation is a part of the Christian journey. Tribulation, part of the Christian journey. He said it right here in our text. They told them in verse 22, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. This is not the great tribulation. That's the hey Magala, Philipsis. This is just tribulation z S on the end of it. There are more than one. Dear friend, you live for Jesus. Tribulation will come your way. Jesus said so. Listen to it in Mark 10, verse 30. You've seen these verses, but he will receive a hundred times. This is a believer. You follow Christ. You see a hundred times as much in the present age. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, farms, along with what? <laughs> Persecutions. And in the age to come eternal life. Jesus went on to say in John 15 verse 18, if this world hates you, you know that it's hated me before it hated you. Friend, if you think this world's hard on you, just know it was hard on Jesus before it was hard on you. Look in verse number 20. Remember the word that I said to you as slaves not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you if they kept my word and they will keep yours also. Friend, if, if they crucified Jesus, if you stand for Christ, this world will come against you. And then that great old text in John 16, 33, where Jesus said, These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you're going to have philipsis. You're going to have tribulation. Take courage. I've overcome the world. Hallelujah. It's coming. Tough times coming. Take courage, have joy. I've overcome the world. Now, everybody, take your Bible. You got your Bible open? Say yes, you got your Bible open. Yes. I need help today. This first crowd was quiet. First Timothy, uh, or I mean, Second Timothy, go to Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, go there. I want you to see these verses. Second Timothy, did I say chapter 2? I meant chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3. Verse 10, now Paul's speaking, look at this, context important, then you'll see verse 12 come up on the screen. Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and suffering, 
such as happened to me where? Antioch, Iconia, Lystra, where he got stoned. Timothy, you know these things. I've told you they persecuted me. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord did what? Hallelujah. This is my testimony. He rescued me indeed. Look at verse number 12. All, all, everyone who desires to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That persecution takes different forms. You students, you're about to have D now this week. And let me tell you, you go, you, you, go, you go back to school with a Bible and a hot heart. And let me tell you, this old world will come against you. You walk in a college class, the Bible and a hot heart for Christ. I'm here to tell you, this old world will come against you. I've been called everything I can think of in the religious realm. In Pensacola, I, I've had people call me an ultra-fundamentalist. I've had people call me a left-leaning liberal. And this week, I was called an anti-Semite. A guy accused me of hating Jewish people. I tried to converse with him. I said, sir, I follow a Jewish man. This Jewish man died for me. He began to say certain things we do as a church are anti-Semitic. I couldn't get to first base. Listen to me now. You take a stand for Christ, you'll have people come against you. There, there'll be a fight. Now, you don't look for a fight. I, I don't like believers that are just looking for a fight. I know some people think they're more spiritual the more they fight. But you don't have to look for a fight. It'll look for you. It'll look you up. You don't have to go hunting a fight. But you cannot run from it either. When perse- you, you know why persecution, persecution comes for two reasons. The Lord allows it for two reasons. You know why tribulation comes in your life? Number one, he toughens the spirit of the believer through tribulation. That's the second reason. The first reason is that he brings us to spiritual brokenness. And we get over ourself. I prayed it early in the service. And I'm going to give it to you again now. Some of you picked up on it because it was a weird prayer. This was my prayer. And it's my prayer. It's been all week long since I heard Mickey Bonner pray it again or I read it. He's dead and gone to heaven. An old friend of Manly Beasley, Mickey Bonner, said, Lord, reveal me to me as you see me. Now listen. Lord, reveal me to me as you see me. Not how I see me, not how Olive sees me, but Lord, reveal me to me as you see me. I'm here to tell you, it'll drive you to your knees. Because God will show you how he sees you. It's not what your wife thinks. Not what your husband or your kids or your parents, your preacher thinks. It's what God thinks about you. Number one, God loves you more than anybody in the world. But he'll be honest about your sin. Some people just kind of cover your sin up and say, ah, you know, I mean, no, no, he won't deal with that. Lord, reveal me to me as you see me. I wish I hadn't read that this week. I've been praying that. I woke up at 3.30 this morning. I saw myself what God was whispering in my ear. I said, Lord, could we do this at (laughs) 7? He said, no, I got your attention right now. Lord, reveal me to me as you see me. Not how I see me. Not how my church sees me. How you see me. Tribulation will bring you to brokenness to the end of yourself. 
Mm. Then number four, disciples need time together. Verse number 28, and they spent a long time with the disciples. G. Campbell Morgan says the Greek context of a long time is at least a year. That when they came back to Antioch before they went on mission trip number two, they spent at least a year with the disciples. Verse 21 says they made disciples. Disciples are made. You must win disciples and then you make disciples. You grow them up. In verse 22 it says they strengthen the soul of the disciples. There are times. Do you know how you make disciples and how you strengthen them? Listen to me. T-I-M-E time. You don't make disciples in the classroom. Classroom's good, but it's just the start. Preaching's good, but it's just the start. You got to hang out to make disciples. Amen. You got to walk and talk and real living. That's how you make disciples. Forty-seven, forty-eight years ago, I became the pastor of the New Lebanon Baptist Church in Odenville, Alabama. We had 44 in Sunday school, the first Sunday I was there. We started preaching. And God began to move. God called four young men to ministry. And I started meeting with them. We were just hanging out on Monday night. They were all single. I was single. We'd meet on Monday night, we'd go visit, we'd spend time in the Word. Then we'd drive 32 miles in to Trustful, Alabama and eat pizza. Dave Paxton used to tell me, Pastor, the greatest spiritual gift to the church is pizza. He said, been more people discipled one to the Lord over pizza than any other two the Lord's ever used. That's what Paxton used to say. Of course, he used to jump out of the ceiling too, so he's crazy, but... You understand this fellowship factor? You hang out in the kitchen with other people. I'm just telling you, you can talk to them about Jesus. Coffee shop. So I hung out with these old boys. One of those men, his first name was Frank. The first time he ever came to New Lebanon Baptist Church, he came drunk on a Sunday morning. Drunk. Sat on the back row. Now, that's no offense to anybody on the back row. All right, I'm just telling you. Matter of fact, the back row was just about right here or in that little church. And he just laid back there. And I preached. He didn't move except to grunt. I went to his house. He wouldn't talk to me. I went in the front door and he went out the back door. He ran from me. He ran from me. He couldn't run from the Holy Ghost. And God gloriously saved him. I did the wedding for he and Glenda, his wife. When the president of Sanford University was here, I asked if he knew him, and he said, well, I know his wife. She's just retired from working. Frank had retired a year before. He read the Greek New Testament like I read a newspaper. It's absolutely phenomenal. How did he get there? Well, he didn't learn any Greek from me, but he learned to walk with Jesus, riding back and forth to the pizza place with me on Monday nights, hanging out at my little apartment on Monday nights. If I saw him now, he would ask me, are you still married? I'd say, yeah. He'd say, I remember the night. I'd say, oh, I'll never forget the night. I'd been married two weeks. We had our discipleship time. We went out and visited, got in the car. We got halfway to Trustful. And I said, stop, I'm married. I got to go home. I forgot. <laughs> I absolutely forgot I was married. I was just in the moment with these guys. They said, oh, Pastor, she forgive you. Come on. And we went down and we called. You couldn't call her. You had no cell phone then. We had to wait till we got to the pizza joint and put a quarter in the box and call her. She said, yeah, it'll be fine. Well, I'm telling you, you got to hang out with the people you want to be like if you're going to grow in grace. And that takes T-I-M-E time. And they stayed a long time, at least a year, G. Campbell Morgan says. What'd they do? I'm just telling you, they ate pizza. And they hung out together. And they learned to walk and talk the gospel. Go to classes, amen. Come to church, yes, indeed. Go to D now. 
But have you a friend that you can walk with and talk with? I have friends out of my early age. If, if they walked in here right now, we said it'd be like we just took, it, took our conversation back up and we've been talking for years. Because we still talk and we text and we back and forth. And what are you doing with this and that? And people buy into your life. If you get five or six of those people into your life, you are a rich Christian. Amen. They pour into you and you pour into them. And they spend a long time with the disciples. Now in a moment, we're going to sing a song. John's coming to sing it. And there's somebody here that doesn't know Christ today and you need to be saved. Somebody's here and need to join the church. I already had some people tell me they're going to join the church today. Amen. So if this is your day to come, then when we sing the very first note, I want you to get up and come. There's some of your whole family needs to come. Some a couple, some you're just by yourself, you need to come. Somebody's here and you don't know Christ, sitting in the balcony or even on this ground floor up in the wings, you don't know Jesus, then come to him today. Come. He saved you today. If you'll come and call on his name. The gospel is for everyone. That includes you. You. You come unto Jesus and he will save you. God's calling and he's calling you to Antioch. So let me ask you this last question. Do you have a testimony? Do you have a testimony of God saving you? Do you have a testimony of God at work in your life? Do you have a testimony of what God's calling you to? If you don't, come run into the altar today and let's let God put something new and fresh within you. Come to Christ this day. I'm going to pray a short prayer. Say amen. And when I say amen, stand up and just stand up coming today unto the Lord and unto his church. Father, I pray that for every one of us, you would reveal us to us as you see us and help us to walk out of here by faith this day with a glorious testimony. In Jesus' name, amen.